We are in our last round of, uh, of the Generative Art Summit, in our last talk round, before we have a grand final presentation. And that is mainly enjoying, but now we talk a bit about uh, the whole thing we had in these two days. I'm welcoming wonderful people. They come from different generations and as well as from different artistic orientations and backgrounds. Ernest Edmonds, uh, he did comp he is doing computer art since the uh, nine end of 1960s, so he is one of the real pioneers. Ernest, would you come up here, please? And uh, then wonderful Anna Maria Caballero. She is a poet, <laughs> like Sasha. She comes uh, from poetry migrating into digital art and digital media. And then Aaron Penny, hardcore technology guy uh, from his beginnings, and uh, really engineering background, but uh, now also working as a director of engineering at Artblocks. But besides this, he's a marvelous artist as well. So um, we have 22 minutes. <laughs> 25 minutes. Um, Ernest, my first question goes, of course, to you, uh, the pioneer of the 20th century, the pioneer of everything we were talking uh, these two days. Um, traditional art and tech art, two different worlds, at least in the 20th century. Do you have any idea why they didn't fit together? So what was your impression when you started to move into the digital world and doing computer art? Thank you. Well, I'll make three points maybe to that. The first is that such a thing is not unusual. When there is a big innovation in the arts, there is usually such a separation. We heard about it at the beginning yesterday, actually, in the context of photography. Uh, think of Impressionism. Uh, think of the Russian avant-garde, the beginning of the last century. These separations are quite normal. Um, so, and it often takes maybe 50 years or so for that separation to heal itself. Uh, but there were some differences, and just talking from a personal point of view, um, back in 1968, as we've just heard, the Computer Arts Society was formed in the UK connected to the British Computer Society, not connected to the arts, but to the computing. And I joined that shortly after it was formed. And that was a community, an organized community, even with some money here and there. Um, and then came, um, we all know, SIGGRAPH, ICEA, um, and um, Jointly with Linda Candy, I formed a Creativity and Cognition Conference in 93, which, without us being involved these days, is still going ahead. I was there in Chicago last week with a conference about these matters, and I was there to talk about my artwork and to show it in the separate exhibition which it had. So this is another life that continues, but is being brought closer and closer to the art world, you might say. And the third point is, and this is personal, that maybe I was fortunate, but soon after I began working in this field, I got to know people in the, quotes, conventional art world in the UK. They were called systems artists. They worked in the constructivist tradition. They used systems. They didn't use computers, but they used mathematics, and then they used paint and whatnot. Um, and I met with them, worked with them, even exhibited with them. So there was a connection. The only sort of slight rider to that is that that group of artists themselves were not all that well connected in with, like, the Royal Academy or, you know, the real conventional art world. So I think it's quite normal in a way, but I think I'm more optimistic because I think we were lucky because we actually built active communities um, through, most people know, for example, SIGGRAPH and ICEA, uh, so that we had a community to work in. So looking to the young 
artists here from the 21st century. Anna, um, how do you feel this reception of your art? Uh, definitely museums got interested in the old historic art now. Um, is it just that art has to become 50 years, then it is getting interesting for the regular museum's world, the uh, art historic world. How do you reflect it? And do you think, do you believe that things have changed compared to the world of Frida Nake, of uh, Ernest Edmonds or Herbert? Uh, so do you see, do you feel you live in a better world? <laughs> wow. Um, that is a wonderful question. Uh, first of all, thank you so much for, for this. It's been an incredible, incredible event. Um, Thanks. You can feel the, the precision and also the love um, throughout. Um, I think that it's, it's hard to say if the world is better or, or worse, but I do think that there is um, renewed interest thanks to the work of, of the pioneers that we've met um, during, during this conference in the work of, of people who are in, in some ways carrying the torch. Um, I, see, I see things happening every day that confirm this belief. Um, I've been part of, of museum exhibitions. Um, for example, Yvonne Atau and I recently had a work together, the collaboration that we did at the Rokla Contemporary Art Museum. Um, there was a massive exhibition organized in Bogota, in Colombia, where I'm from, at the most important museum there of digital art. Um, that included generative, but not only generative art, and it was only digital, and it was, um, I think, something really, really new for, for the crowd there. Um, and then you also, of course, have museums that have been doing the work for a long time. Of course, HEC comes to mind immediately, and I think that there's a huge relevance um, to the work that they're showing, bringing it into dialogue with work that comes before it, but also acknowledging it as, as its own unique thing. Mm -hmm. And, and Aaron, how about your perception of uh, the generative art world in the traditional art world? Uh, I have a bit of a, a hot take about it. Frankly, as an artist, it's none of my business, I think. I like to focus uh, on the things that I can deal with, and that is making the most interesting work that I can, and letting the external factors, such as uh, public acceptance, take care of themselves and leave that to the external folks. Um, I, I often talk about my work in relation to acceptance by institutions or commercial success, and a lot of my peers do as well. One thing I was thinking yesterday while listening to Pioneers was that wasn't part of the conversation at all. It felt much more like creating artwork to follow a line of inquiry or pursue some curiosity or research, uh, making work for the sake of the work itself. I think that's the artist's obligation to focus there, do the best work that you possibly can. Um, but I will say that aside, uh, I think this is the art of our time. It's technology-based, it's using, uh, you know, technology is more ubiquitous than ever, more folks are interfacing with machines, writing code, interfacing in other ways, and it's emblematic of the time period that we live in that this sort of artwork has reached a, a broader acceptance. Mm -hmm. um, Ernest, uh, you, uh, did you have any clue about the development of this kind of art, of generative art to today, especially after our two days here, and also the question, um, did, did you find some new informations uh, seeing all these presentations we had here, not only the pioneers, that's very clear, you have all, everything in mind, but did you find some new ideas or, or interpretations of, of the day, of the today's generative art? Yes, I, in fact, I mean, this has been the most wonderful time that we've been spending. Um, Thank you so much for making it happen. Um, of course, I've heard things from people I know very well, from friends and whatnot, where I pretty much could guess what they would say. But I've also, and that, this is the exciting thing for me about it, I've heard from people who I didn't know and where I didn't know what they were going to say, so there are many new things. Um, I think that the, uh, the, the interest between the material uh, and the abstract is a, a dimension that has been shifting since I began. And now, I don't think we have a like solution to this thing, but I, there is a shift and lots of new questions being raised. Uh, and, and so I go away thinking very hard about this. And I'm thinking of like, how do you compare uh, a digital file to a 
the score in a piece of music, for example. And if you own the score, do you own the music? <laughs> if you own the file, do you own the artwork? And I won't go on, but there are many, many questions that must be in all our minds around there that are in the air and in discussion in these meetings. Uh, and so issues such as this are very real. I don't think the discussion about ownership is such a big deal, but I think the, the question about what is the artwork is a, is a big deal and is a very interesting one. Um, and the main thing I would say, though, is I see a continuity. I remember you saw on the slides here um, just a few moments ago a picture of a paper that Stroud Cornock and I produced in 1970 where we, it was a kind of mission statement with lots of concepts of the future uh, which were impossible to realize when we wrote that paper but we thought this might be the future. Well what I've seen here is that that is the future and how exciting to see these things happening, only happening in a much bigger and more impressive way than Stroud and I ever imagined. To be honest, I was very overwhelmed by the today's presentations. Well, I know the artists, of course, but to see this compri compressed in one day, all this information, that was very uh, fantastic for me personally, too, uh, coming also from the old world, because I was, how should I say, located in Herbert's thinking. And it is wonderful to see that maybe there's more freedom between these two worlds that were dividing artists at the uh, in the 20th century, where you had um, the analytically, intellectually coding people on one side, thinking about it, or, and on the other side, the emotional, intuitive people. I think these two worlds come together, but I'm not quite sure about this. I have the feeling, at least, in, in several of the presentations that the two worlds merge a bit more. So uh, maybe we start with, with the technician here and the engineer. Um, what is your feeling about that? You, you come definitely from one world, uh, so how do you see that? I think um, the evidence is in this room. Um, most of us and hundreds of people that do this as a, a practice who aren't here um, are evidence that living in both worlds and merging them into something special happens daily amongst many people. Um, I think the accessibility of tools nowadays is really important and the educational focus of organizations around those tools, um, like the Processing Foundation, which me and a lot of peers are indebted to. Um, but I think the the crossover between the two cultures is um, made possible by code as a creative medium. You have uh, technical thinkers um, unlocking some creative ability, and you have artists um, discovering some technical skill, and that's facilitated by this exact medium. So I think it's um, becoming more of a uh, more of a prevalent thing. Um, I wanted to read a quote real quick from Ruth Levitt, who she wrote this in 1976 in the Artist and Computer um, publication, which features Dr. Bill and Frieder. Um, she references this sort of thing. She says, quote, the union of art and science and computer art is reflective of the times in which we live. Ours is a technological society, one which demands interdisciplinary approaches to problems. Our lives are closely linked to one another, therefore we must communicate, end quote. And this summit, I think, is a perfect example of that needed communication. Mm -hmm. And Anna, how, how about your reflections about that subject? Well, as a poet, um, I recently completed um, an MFA. It took me seven years between life and children, <laughs> but I did it. Never too late to, to learn a new tri uh, skill, right, or a trick. Um, and while I was um, finishing this MFA that I was doing, you know, in a really sort of deliberately slow way, um, I entered Web3 and was actively presenting my poetry all over the world um, and engaging with new art forms, with new mediums. And I couldn't help to think how disjointed the poetry education of today is um, with what's possible. And I really think that the poetry education of the future needs to change so that poets are given um, like the license to, to want more to think about um, presenting their works as artworks. 
uh, of collaborating with artists or of learning new tools themselves, especially because they're becoming more and more accessible. Um, so that's one thing that I'm actually right now working on is redesigning the curriculum of what my dream poetic education would look like, where you're, of course, you know, diving into Emily Dickinson, but also um, learning a little bit of JavaScript, right not. Mm -hmm. So uh, we had this marvelous presentation of Sasha before uh, from her AI, which is the difference between AI that is uh, generated by using huge data, uh, but any kind of data, and producing an AI that is used, dedicated, selected, uh, quality data uh, database. Did you think about that, that it is possible um, to do that kind of things, uh, Ernest, uh, to do language, uh, AI? Uh, well, we thought about, in fact, AI was implied in the title of that 1970 paper, and I've used AI in my work all the time. The difference is the large databases that the AI could access. So it's really machine learning across very, very large databases that was kind of expected, but it's much bigger than we imagined. It was slightly beyond imaginable, the size of, the size of data. So yes, there have been a lot of things are happening like that that are um, beyond what could early have been imagined. But Many other things have happened that we kind of expected, and I think that this business between the intuitive or, or improvisational and the highly structured, uh, like systems things, is something that is not so strange. And in fact, there are, there are roots in the middle. There's an there's a area in music called live coding, uh, where people uh, produce music from code but they project the code onto the screen while you hear the sound art, uh, and they change it. And they're improvising by coding. They're not coding to a system. They're thinking, oh, I think I'm going to change this line of code here. And it's like intuitive. Okay. So intuitive doesn't have to be like sweeping a brush across a canvas. It can be suddenly deciding to write a different line of code. And so there is a connection much closer connection than we sometimes imagine. Aaron, do, do we too much focus today on AI, on, on these kind of jet GPT things, um, talking about AI? Should we be more aware of that AI is all, can also follow different te technological concepts like Ernest mentioned and uh, Sasha is doing, or also um, uh, Mario Klingemann is doing. How about your ideas about that? Or? Yeah, I think uh, the chat GPT sort of thing that everyone's excited about and focused on is just one aspect of the potential for these kinds of tools. I'm more interested in what Sasha and Mario and Ernest have talked about. Um, I think there's great potential with any new tool, and we should pay attention to it, of course. But yeah, I think we talk about it too much. Mm -hmm. I'm more interested in the human potential, I think. Mm -hmm. So we have uh, a few minutes left. Uh, I would like to go to the special subject I discussed with these wonderful people, here, my friends here on, on the uh, panel. Um, I, I thought, as it is the last intellectual exchange we have in our summit, I would like to end with two quotes of Herbert's, uh, very short quotes, quotes from Herbert's book, um, Art and Construction, and ask for the reflections these, these uh, particip participants have. And um, as Anna, she has such a wonderful voice, um, I, I asked her whether she would be uh, accept accepting to read these, and I think uh, we, we are starting with the first one, and then maybe um, Aaron and, and uh, Ernest will have a few words about it before we go to the second one, and uh, then f close this with your remarks on it. Perfect. I firmly believe that a process does not lose its ability to instill wonder when we succeed 
in uncovering some of the laws and connections that determine it. Not wanting to know the explanation of something, even though it can easily be learned, amounts to willfully deceiving oneself. Aaron. Um, I can only speak for myself, but I suspect many of the artists here with science and technology perspective share this view that the process is precisely where the wonder exists. That's where the awe is inspired and, and the exciting things happen. Um, I think there's an inherent curiosity required, so I agree wholeheartedly with Herbert. There's an inherent curiosity required to dive into a system or to further create one. Um, and a lack of, or, and by having that curiosity, you have to learn and grow. And I think that a lack of growth is death. And so by contrast, if you have this curiosity and, and you're looking into some system or some process, you're fostering that and fostering life. So I think it's very important to understand the tools and the systems that you're working with and potentially create your own, of course. I, <clears throat> I agree very much with this quote, as I do with so much that Herbert has said, which is why one reason why I'm so happy to be here. And you explained uh, yesterday when you were talking with Anne and Michael Spalter, what, I think why I agree with almost everything he said, because you said that he was concerned to explore uh, the aesthetic dimensions of the technologies. And that's really what I've spent my life trying to do. And the point is that that it means exploring it in some level of detail. In fact, understanding this detail. And I find it odd that any artist would not want to know more about the medium that they use. It would seem a strange thing for me, whatever medium they're using. And the fact that you understand something doesn't stop the wonder in the perception of it, because these are different processes. And the understanding of the underlying mathematics or whatever it is that generates something uh, doesn't take away the wonder that the perceptual system creates in our heads. OK. Anna? The intervention of technology in the visual arts and the performing arts is unmistakable. Equally, equally certain is that a fusion between technical and artistic processes has been initiated. And my response to this quote is actually the poem that I wrote for the tribute to Herbert. Um, in this poem, what I did was that I incorporated every single JavaScript command that I used to visualize the verse into the poem itself. And I even snuck some of it into um, the Spanish bits. So some of you will recognize some of the commands um, in what I'm about to read. Poem. I'll create the background of this canvas once. So listen up. It was startling, yet sought, like the striking of a match. Now, burnt. I can't reset to a point before red begins. I am drawn by, drawn to, drawn from. A newly unveiled translation of original sin. Word as want, but also as the cliff of my throat, unable to say how everything hides in the ghost white bite of your teeth. I unthink to function, delete, so I might breathe. But no matter how I stand, I remain a child at the foot of your bed dragging a tattered indigo rabbit, hoping to be let in. If I type in another language, can I frame truth less brutal? No. Si lo cuento en español, juro que es peor. Es peor. 
dark font cycle through me, like urgent news demanding to be printed, algorithmic, parasitic, and yet lyric. I rotate the viral vowels of your name, forming tercets, couplets, become the only contestant in a daytime game show who yells the phrase, spins the wheel, takes the prize, until filled and resized, I find I've played hard enough to exorcise. I shout loud to be heard beyond perpetual gyre. Someone Please, text me the code that shuts this circuitry off. Wonderful. Thanks, Thanks so much, my dear friends. Um, it's time for us to, to leave now. Can we um, give Suzanne a round of applause, please? <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. <laughs>